cameras and recording and everything. So you're all set. Good. So I'm going to call this meeting of the Committee on Rules, Orders, and Appointments and Ordinances to order. Um, I'm Councilor David Murphy, I'll chair. Councilor Morgan Carney is here. And Councilor Ryan Pinal is here. And uh, here are the members of ordinance. And we're going to do a little quick bit ordinance business, which is uh, you've got your roll call and everything there. No. Um, it is being audio and video recorded a couple of times, probably to be on the North Street Neighborhood Association or the server at uh, NCTV. The only thing on our agenda tonight is to deal with the stormwater ordinance. And we'll open it as a public hearing. We will have DPW present the status quo as the proponent. And then at that point, we will take comments from uh, opponents or people who just want to make comments. But if anybody wants to make an initial public comment, all of our meetings have public comment at the beginning. If there's anybody that wants to say their piece now under public comment and be on their way and not stay for the whole thing, is welcome to do so at this point. Uh, Councilor Adams. Thank you, Chair. Jesse Adams, I live on Lake Street, Florence. I wanted to discuss three of the amendments that I, I took part in. The first one is the cap. The cap that I drafted um, is, is a limitation on what can be raised. And it does two important things. The first thing that it does, it creates a limit on growth for any given year. That limit is important because many members of the public want to know how we can keep this fee from rising substantially, like we've seen with other fees, for example, the water and sewer fees. This fee also creates a limit. The fee also needs to be able to, uh, to raise a sufficient amount of funds so that it can fund meaningful stormwater and flood control improvements. So the cap that I created allows um, for that amount to the, the, the initial limit to be exceeded if a supermajority of the council agrees. So in this way, it balances those, those two important interests. <coughs> Another important amendment is uh, I, I recommended with one of my amendments striking the exemptions um, for land that have agricultural and conservation restrictions. I believe it should be struck. Um, the, the task force stated as one of its basic premises is that the fee should be fair and equitable. To this end, they stated from the very beginning of their deliberations that as a matter of fairness and equity, everyone should, should pay. And we heard this over and over, that everyone should pay. Um, and the reason why is because the, the premise is that everyone benefits from stormwater and flood control. All properties are paying. Residential, commercial, nonprofits, federals and state properties, even the city must pay. There are good arguments for certain other properties and certain other categories of properties to be exempt, but any exemption would be unfair. And, the, and, and this particular exemption for these types of um, lands, agricultural and conservation, are similarly unfair. In fact, one of the strongest arguments that this is a fee and not a tax is that everyone must pay. Exempting no properties makes the ordinance less likely to be successfully challenged in court, and any suit would be extremely expensive. And any of these properties would be paying a total of $100 maximum. If one uh, individual or entity owned numerous types of properties that fell into those types of categories of, of restriction, they would be paying only $100 maximum. And on top of that, they'd be eligible for credits. So um, again, as a matter of fairness and equity, I, it is my hope that this committee agrees that those two types of exemptions should not be uh, permitted because they're unfair. Now, <clears throat> importantly, the amendment that ensures that the funds be used for what we promised the residents, that's 280-8M. This process, to, to get to this point, <coughs> we think what we, we've seen what I think is an unprecedented, open and inclusive and lengthy process where we reached out to our constituents to inform them of this extremely important and, and new fee. It was stated time and time again in open public forums that the, fund, that the funds raised from this fee would be used only for stormwater and flood control measures and not to supplement the general fund. We guaranteed our constituents time and time again that this would not be a source of general budget fund relief and that it would have, it would have greater spending restrictions than other enterprise funds. That is what the public wanted and that is what we guaranteed the public. Last night, the Board of Public Works voted against this amendment, which was unanimously endorsed 
by the Chamber of Commerce's Economic Development Committee. The Board of Public Works cited a few reasons that they, in, when they voted against it. The reasons were all enterprise funds should have the same rules, the fund is no different from the other funds that we have in this city, and as long as it's within state, state as long as it's in compliance with state law, that's, that, that's enough, that's okay, and there don't need to be further restrictions. So let me address the point about all the funds having the same rules. Um, that this fund is different. It's quite different. And all funds don't need to have the same rules. All funds shouldn't have the same rules necessarily. Nearly every community has a water and sewer fee, but only a few in this state have a stormwater and flood control fee similar to the one that's before you for consideration. It's a unique type of fund that is a, is a tough sell to the community on the heels of an override, and so it should not be treated as every other fund. It should not be treated as every other enterprise fund. It's unique, and our constituents are served by greater restrictions on its spending, and it's perfectly reasonable to restrict the spending of the funds in a way that's consistent with how we sold this concept to the public. Let me uh, address that the point that was made. Well, it's in compliance with state, state law, so that's good enough. Well, of course it's in compliance with state law. I mean, we wouldn't operate illegally. But let me also let me let me tell you what what the law says in this matter. I'm reading straight from the Department of Revenue uh, Enterprise Fund Manual um, that helps guide us through the Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 44, Section 3F, that um, regulates enterprise funds. I'm reading straight from that. Indirect cost allocation method, method, excuse me, methodology. The Bureau recommends that every community with an enterprise fund establish a written internal policy regarding indirect cost allocation and should review this policy annually. The policy should be reasonably calculated in a fair and consistent basis. Local financial officials should understand and agree on what indirect costs are appropriated as part of the general fund operating budget and what percentage of these costs should be allocated to the enterprise fund. That's exactly what this amendment sets out to do and that's exactly what it does do. And further on in that same manual put out by the Department of Revenue um, in, in frequently asked questions, it states, what if there is a disagreement of the indirect costs? Which expenses and how much of an enterprise fund? And the answer to that question is indirect costs should be clearly set forth, specifically what costs sh will be shared and how much, when the budget is adopted to avoid disputes later in the fiscal year. Ideally, it should be set forth in writing. And extremely importantly, resolution of any disagreement is purely a local matter. The Department of Revenue does not prescribe how to treat these expenditures. It's a local option and that's how it's to be treated. They suggested putting in writing. That's what I did to be as clear as possible and to be consistent with what we all promise the people that we represent. That is the purpose of this amendment and it is pursuant to the regulations of the Department of Revenue. This fund is different. This amendment is what I did so that we could ensure that we are following the DOR's best practices. But the most important reason to support my amendment is that it's consistent with what the public has been told from the beginning. Why treat this fund differently? It's because it is different than other funds. It's a tougher sell. Why deviate from what we told the public during our unprecedented process? That process was exemplary. And what we told the community time and time again during this process was that the fees would not be used to supplement the general fund. Making a change of this magnitude a few weeks before it is scheduled to come to the council floor for the first reading would, would not be fair. And, and the only way we could really make it fair at that point would, would be to start this process over completely. And I don't think anybody wants to do that. If this amendment passes, we'll be honoring our commitment to the public by codifying the limit on spending right in the ordinance and we'll be following what the DOR asks us to do. To make a change this late in the game that allows money from this fund to supplement the, the general fund, we leave ourselves open to the criticism that we are backdoor, we are backdooring a Proposition 2.5 override that the city did not get to vote on. Please, let's be consistent. Let's honor the DOR's recommendation, recommended best practices. Let's be true to our constituents. I urge you to pass the amendment as written. Thank you. All right, is there anyone else that wishes to speak prior to DPW's presentation? If you do, Mr. Jasky, you want to come up prior to the... Rich Jasky, Bridge Road, Northampton. As this <coughs> hearing proceeds, 
I would like you to take into account all the land on the outside. Uh, I'm also a member of the Act Commission. The land on the outside of the flood dikes is totally sacrificial. There's land that might not even be there after a major flood. So as you're considering this, I think it's totally unfair to put a fee on that land in particular because it might not, not even be farmable, might not even be tillable <coughs> after a flood. And of course, a flood is what we're worried about. Um, I also do want to thank uh, the BPW and all the work they put into this. Uh, but I do want that to be considered. I think Wayne Fighting also brought to fore uh, the fact that farmland is uh, actually an area where the water might be absorbed. I can understand there might be some, uh, how can I say it, some um, discussion on that. But uh, my point is the land on the other side of the flood dikes uh, to me seems to be almost sacrificial. So uh, I did want to bring that to your attention. Anybody else want to comment prior to the DPW presentation? All right, everyone will get a chance to speak. Um, and uh, if that may be after the presentation. So, Mary, should we actually post this as a public hearing or just a meeting? A meeting, yeah. City Council. <coughs> All right. Um, then, just to, to address the posting of the City Council meeting, uh, we were concerned when we posted it that a quorum may be reached of the City Council here tonight. And it appears there is a quorum here. Um, they won't be participating as counselors. This is a, a committee meeting. They're here and they'll act as members of the public and come up and speak from there. So there will be no council action taken, but we did this some time ago just to cover ourselves in case we did get quorum, which we have. So since this wasn't posted to the public hearing, we don't have to actually open it as a public hearing. So what I'm going to do is ask Mr. Colhane uh, with any assistance he needs from staff to come up and walk us through the original DPW presentation. Then he's going to walk us through what we're kind of calling the friendly amendments that came from Councillor Adams and uh, Councillor O'Donnell. Uh, the things that there's meeting of the minds on. Then there were some proposals that staff came up with based on knowledge that they've acquired since the process began, which I think everybody's familiar with, but they'll explain that. And then uh, the one thing that Councillor Adams spoke about, which we are calling M, which was the issue we brought up last night, that there was an agreement on with DPW. We will handle that one last. So what I'm trying to do is look at the original ordinance, those amendments, friendly or technical, that have come since, and then do the one contentious one at the end, because that's the one that we'll probably spend most of our time on. And if anybody, you know, if, if when Mr. Colhane pr presents, if any of the makers of those amendments um, have anything they want to comment on when that happens, please let us know uh, if you made one of those amendments and we, we can get your input at that point. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, also, just to clarify, as I understood from our, um, we had a big presentation on the open meeting in our, our last council meeting, and this is um, really the first, uh, first since that discussion of a subcommittee meeting that has a quorum of the council present. My understanding was that despite the fact that we had posted this as a concurrent city council meeting, we would not be engaging in back and forth at all with any of the councils here. So that even though we may have questions, in fact, I have some questions, and unfortunately we're not at a, um, at a meeting where we could ask those questions of, of our colleagues on the council. So some of those would have to then be resolved at the <coughs> city council meeting where it's expected that the public would um, really expect to hear the full deliberation of this now. And again, that's the that's really the line there that we're we're not permitted to deliberate as council unless we're in council, <laughs> and so we won't be doing that tonight, even though it was posted that it was posted as a potential meeting. So, Mr. Colhane, if you want to come <coughs> walk us through the DPW proposal and those those amendments we considered friendly, and then the technical ones that staff is wants to modify with. Uh, thank you. So just to broadly recap, uh, the city is facing the need to raise more money. We need to spend more money in the coming years on stormwater and flood control than we've been accustomed to spending in the past. Uh, this is being driven by changes in the EPA regulations and new requirements coming from the um, Army Corps of Engineers 
regarding how flood control works. This has been discussed within the city uh, administration, uh, within the city council, within the Board of Public Works for the past year or two. Um, in early in 2013, the city council established a task force to look at this issue. They were pr primarily looking at two specific issues. One is, if we need to raise X amount of new money, what's the best way we can do that? And broadly speaking, they supported the implementation of a new fee. And then secondly, if there is to be a fee, the task force considered what would be the best way to implement a fee. And they came up with a couple of options, reported back to the city council. It was then turned over to the Board of Public Works, Department of Public Works, to advance the thinking <coughs> further, which ultimately led to this ordinance, which we have before us today. <coughs> Broadly speaking, in the initial ordinance, uh, if you probably have a copy in front of you, well, there's a discussion of the purpose, which is to fund all of the expenses related to our stormwater drainage system and our flood control system. Discussion about authority, there's a number of definitions. What is a credit? What is a drainage system? What's a dwelling unit? Just laying out the basic definitions of what we're going to be talking about. What is stormwater? It then establishes, as you can see in page four, it establishes the mechanism for a stormwater and flood control fee. The fee, broadly speaking, will be. Sorry, could you actually, instead of referring to page, you can see the way I've calculated the I'm, I'm in now section 280 5. Thank you. Basically, we're setting up a scheme for a quarterly billing. Um, again, we're referring to the receipts generated through this utility. Be put into a special account for the sole purpose of being used for stormwater and flood control expenses. The annual budget will be developed by the Department of Public Works and the Board of Public Works and presented to the City Council for the City Council's consideration and approval. So all of the expenses will be run through the approval process of the, of the City Council. We propose if I could just step outside the ordinance for a second. The best proxy we have for determining the stormwater runoff impact of a particular property is how big is the property? Presumably large properties have more runoff than a small parcel of land. The problem with, and again, I'm speaking outside of the uh, specific ordinance. The problem with just saying, okay, fine, let's measure the square footage and calculate is that it would put an enormous burden on open land, forested land, large tracts of land, which really, in many respects, have favorable runoff characteristics. Forest land can absorb the water much more readily than a, an acre of pavement. So it was, became clear <coughs> as we were working on this that it would be a good idea to think of a way to weight the different types of property in such a way that those properties that generate the most runoff pay the lion's share of the fee. Uh, to that end, in, in section 280-6, uh, um, we begin discussing ways to organize the fee. Broadly speaking, impervious surface, which would be a roof, pavement, something along of that nature, will be billed almost on a square foot for, per square foot basis. We're actually proposing to modify the amount of impervious square footage by a factor of 0.95. So maybe not 100% of the water runs off, maybe 95 runs off because there are cracks in the pavement or there are seams or, the, or there's a leak in the roof. The other category of property is pervious property, which would be lawns, agricultural land, forested land. And in that case, the task force proposed dramatically reducing the amount of pervious surface that's re that, that will get built. They came up with two mechanisms for doing that. First, the amount of pervious surface that you're responsible to pay a fee on is capped at one acre. 
So if you have 1.1 acres of pervious surface, we're going to bring it down to one acre and generate the bill on that. If you have 50 acres, bring it down to one acre. The second way of adjusting the square footage in a way that favors pervious land that can absorb water is once we've determined the amount of pervious surface, it's then multiplied by a factor of 0.1. So you're only billed for a tenth of the pervious surface. Impervious, 95%. Pervious, <coughs> 10%. And it's capped at one acre. And this is described in sections 280-6. When it comes to residential properties, we have about <coughs> 6,600 single and two and three family houses in Northampton. And we are recommending that these properties be treated in groups. Specifically, we propose to break these 6,600 basically small residential properties into small, medium, and large. And at least in this initial proposal, we are proposing to do that by taking all properties that have less than 2,000 square feet of pervious surface and calling them the small properties. Between two and 4,000 square feet of pervious, impervious surface, that would be a medium, over 4,000 square feet, a large property. Uh, so that, that roughly explains the, the mechanism. Those properties that don't fall into those small residential categories, those three tiers, those properties would get um, billed based on calculations made property by property. City Hall here, they'd measure the size, measure the, the scope of the property, and calculate for City Hall what would be the bill. What would be the bill for Cooley Dickinson, for Cooper's Corner? Each one will be calculated individually. There are about 2,600 properties that fall into that broad category. In section 280.8, purposes of the fund, this lists the specific um, areas where the funds can be expended. Uh, essentially, it, it lists all of the ways we might need to spend money on our stormwater collection system or on our flood control system. Uh, the initial amendment, or the initial proposal, suggests that there be a couple of exceptions. In a second. Cancel that. I got ahead of myself. 280-9 uh, um, discusses municipal expenses. Um, and it's, it states that we propose that the municipality does get a bill for city property. 280-10, we discuss a credit mechanism. Uh, just parenthetically, the, city, the Board of Public Works is probably going to approve the credit manual at tomorrow night's meeting. Uh, then from there on, it's mostly um, mechanisms. The bills go out four times a year. What happens if you're delinquent? Uh, what if you feel that your property has been not measured correctly and thus your bill calculated incorrectly? And that's the gist of the bill, the gist of the ordinance that we are proposing. Do anyone have any questions at this point for sure on the initial part of it? Um, not, on, not on the mechanisms that you described, Terry, but just uh, maybe your general impressions. Um, I was only at one of the, <coughs> excuse me, at one of the ward presentations of this matter. But you, I think you have done it probably all seven. Yeah, well, except for one. Oh, okay, so a, a good number. And, um, I don't know my colleagues have been probably not in as many as you. <clears throat> so just generally, what's the largest, you know, the greatest concerns that you've heard of the way on this? I, I have to admit, I was pleasantly surprised by the feedback we got. Um, I was told, you know, a dozen, two dozen times that people came feeling quite skeptical about it and left feeling at least resigned to it. Um, the arguments made sense. Uh, the questions that we got tended to be implementational. For example, I have a shared driveway. How do we figure that out? I live in a condominium complex. Will I get the bill as the condo owner or does the association get the bill as a condo owner? 
So the, <coughs> the majority of the questions I, I feel were procedural, uh, you know, discussing how would it be implemented, when would it start, would the bills be semi-annual, annual, quarterly. Um, I, I was re reassured by the, the reaction. Um, in, in this original drafting of the ordinance, I think it would be helpful if you would remind us of the, of the rough costs uh, based on a $2 million budget for uh, the small, medium, and large residential properties. What's your calculation? Um, I believe small is $61, medium is 97 and the largest properties, those with more than 4,000 square feet of impervious surface, $233 per year. And as you say, that would be based on a hypothetical $2 million budget. If it was a $1 million budget, it would just be cut by 50%. Build quarterly. Build quarterly. It would come with your water and sewer bills. Um, water and sewer currently comes on the same piece of paper. It would just be another line item on the same piece of paper. Apparently, the uh, software that generates those bills is easily capable of adding another line item. Um, in the computation of impervious area, the, the math for that, mm -hmm. is there an appeals process if a property owner feels that that is incorrect? Oh yes, that that was I referred to that near the end there. Maybe I skipped over it too quickly. Um, in section 280-12 on the last page, um, the first the first line of appeal is to just bring your situation to the Department of Public Works, say, I think you've made a mistake here, mm -hmm. and this is why. And, and I suspect in almost every case, it would be resolved at that level. It, it, it's... I mean, it's a factual thing. It yeah, it, it's, it's measurable. measurable. So. We would send someone out, measure it, and say, oh, you're right. Uh, apologies and adjust the bill accordingly. In the case of uh, not reaching an, an accommodation between the Department of Public Works and a, a property owner, it would go to the Board of Public Works for further discussion and our input. And the other the other appeal thing I noticed was that this involved the appellate tax board. Is that typical of other enterprise funds? I would have to ask. Y yes. It only involves them in the case of a delinquency. A delinquency. Yeah. But that they are involved in it. Surprisingly. Historically, if you um, fell behind on your water bill or your sewer bill, eventually it would be added to your tax bill. For the purposes of fault. Exactly. Okay. So that's how it winds up there is because it goes on with everything else. Right. Now, one of the features of fee is that the fee can be broadly applied across all uh, property types, including nonprofit properties. They don't get a tax bill. And it's been explained to me that despite the fact that they don't get a tax bill, if a lien were placed on the property, it would be called a tax bill. Although it wouldn't be actually a tax. But a the mechanism, uh, the city treasurer assures me, it's the same mechanism. And, uh, and, and just for people who watch this, one of the reasons, and it was people have said, and I'm sure they asked you this question at the various board meetings, <coughs> why why didn't this just get added to the basic tax levy of the city? And that is, as you've explained at the meetings, because it does apply to everybody, including the nonprofits. Right. So and, I mean, you were asked that at every meeting, I assume. If I remember the, the percentages correctly, we've shown people pie charts. And under the current f funding mechanism for these expenses, which is the general fund, residential properties pay 83% of the total bill. Under this new scheme with a fee, because it's now applied to municipal properties and nonprofit uh, properties, the residential portion <coughs> of the total bill will drop to around 53 or 54%. So, so it's a profound decrease in the share paid by the basic homeowners. Because exactly. They, and Obviously, the homeowners probably, for property type, have the least impervious area compared to commercial properties or even the nonprofits. Yes, that's true. Right. Any any other questions from up here? Well, uh, there just we made reference to the uh, small, medium, and large, and I know that we'll be hearing more detail from the staff around the 25 percent, 50 percent, or 25 mm -hmm. as relates to that. Um, 
So uh, I'm assuming that then, I guess we're going to say that is, is something that um, the Board of Public Works um, did prefer to get their discussion. At various times we've, uh, in, as this has gone on over the last year or two, <coughs> at various times we've thought of other schemes. Uh, at one point we said, let's just have a flat residential rate. And we heard from many homeowners who felt that their properties were small enough that they would rather prefer not to be lumped in with larger properties. Thought that it would be fairer if the, uh, the bill, the annual bill reflected the small size of the property. So we went back to the small, medium, large uh, proposal. Um, in this original in incarnation of, of the ordinance, yes. um, there was an exemption for land that had an agricultural preservation. There, yeah, and, and, right, and, and, and the conservation. I think you were beginning to talk about that yes. um, in, in your presentation, but just because we're going to talk about it later with the amendments, could you describe your original thinking of why? Well, the, the planning department and Wayne Fyden argued for some... Uh, some exclusion to be made in those two properties. He, he explained to me it's very difficult getting people to consider permanent, these are permanent restrictions. You can't change your mind. And he said it's hard enough getting people to um, consider that kind of designation and he could use every tool in his toolbox. He thought it would be um, one more incentive. In terms of numbers, it frankly doesn't amount to that much compared to the overall size of this. It would be about $17,000 if we granted these um, exemptions to those two categories. So it, initially the thinking was uh, it wasn't a lot of money in the scheme of things and it uh, appeared to garner support from uh, the city planner, the planning department, and by extension the Agricultural uh, Agriculture Committed Commission. So now, if you could, um, that's the original version. Could you step through the nine original amendments proposed by Councillor Adams that were what we'll call friendly amendments that there was a meeting of the minds between DPW yes. and Councillor Adams that were agreeing to incorporate? Now, this is a draft labeled uh, February 11, 2014. Yes. You may not have color copies. Uh, but if you do, they're the ones with all red oh, comments. <coughs> Up at the top, you see JL1, JL2. Uh, these are proposed amendments by Councilors Adams and O'Donnell. Okay. Um, if you go to Section 280-4, they propose that direct cost shall mean cost incurred in the operation and maintenance of the stormwater and flood control utility. So they're, they're proposing to insert uh, a definition of direct costs. Uh, as you can see off to the side, we had some comments on that, but broadly speaking, uh, we have, you know, no, no real comment on this. Um, it's, it's fine as, as far as the Department of Public Works and the Board of Public, Public Works is concerned. Moving on, uh, indirect cost, this is another definition added by uh, amendment. Indirect cost shall mean employee benefits, insurance, and costs paid by the city of Northampton separately that are allocable to the direct cost of the stormwater and flood control utility. Uh, again, uh, yeah, we, we think that's a reasonable. Moving on to section 280-6 under rates. Uh, this is just the, uh, adjusting the, uh, the wording slightly. The annual budget for stormwater management and flood control services shall be based upon the recommendations S of the Board of Public Works and shall be approved by a majority vote of the City Council, period. And then rather than say it's the intent of the City Council, uh, Councilor Adams suggests the Council, City Council will, and 
and say, again, that, that seems perfectly right, perfectly reasonable. Mm -hmm. uh, just, just a question, and perhaps Councillor Adams can chime in on this, but the original version of these amendments had um, under 288, um, deleting the first sentence and replacing that to that. Unfortunately, I, I disagree with the, our discussion we had at the House Committee the other night, but my sense was that there was to be, there was to be no back and forth with Council. Mm -hmm. Then I, the, Mr. Colhane can answer this then, I'm sure. <coughs> answer this. All right, so I, I, I missed the, uh, where, where are we? 288, the purpose of the fund by deleting the first sentence and replacing with the following sentence, the stormwater and flood control utility shall only be used for direct and indirect costs. 288. 280 4. So you're quite a ways ahead? No. 280 8. Yeah, it, well, the, the amendment list that Councillor Adams submitted, I guess, well, go ahead, because it may be out of order. Yeah, I, I, have, I haven't gotten there yet. Is. So, so w when we talk about direct cost, indirect cost a moment ago, we're in that definition section under 280 4. Well, go ahead and if this one doesn't appear, I'll okay. ask you what happens. Okay. Definitions. We don't admit any of them. Okay. Uh, definitions continue on um, through until we reach section 280-5. 280-6. 280-7. And um, again, uh, just a little wordsmithing. Councilor Adams proposed proposes that upon recommendations of the Board of Public Works, um, the annual budget shall be approved by majority vote of the City Council. The City Council will set the annual budget at an amount which will be sufficient to provide for balanced operating and capital budgeting for the stormwater management and flood control services. Again, we're supportive of that language. Moving on to Section B, originally we had suggested for the first five years of the utility operation the revenue raised by the utility should not exceed $2 million per year. And then we, con we continued in our proposal, beginning in year six, the revenue shall be adjusted based on the recommendation of the Board of Public Works, subject to the approval of the City Council. <coughs> Councilor Adams proposes that the language should go on after year five. The language should then say, beginning in the sixth year, revenue shall be adjusted based on the recommendation of the Board of Public Works subject to the approval of the City Council as described above. The revenue raised by the utility shall not exceed $2 million per year, plus the cost of inflation as determined by the Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics, Consumer Price Index, unless the budget receives a vote of at least six, uh, in a sense, a sense of supermajority of the City Council. So broadly he's saying, Beginning in year six, we can be, it can be indexed with the consumer price index, and anything above and beyond that would require a supermajority. Um, again, we feel this is a, I mean, that's why you guys get the big money. This is a political decision. We're fine with this. <coughs> Moving down, in section G, We're, we're still in section 280-6, uh, rates. We're down in section uh, G. Calculation, so originally we said calculations of bills for each property shall be determined by the Department of Public Works, period. Uh, Jesse, uh, Councilor Adams is suggesting that we replace that with, after calculating the billing rate per square foot of hydraulic area, the Board of Public Works shall establish a unit rate for each of the three classes of small residential properties in accord with subsection C. Uh, we have a, a word smithing. We, we were thinking instead of saying unit rate, standardized fee might be better, but broadly we're, we're fine with this. Yes. Um, this, this, 
this is a very minor thing, but the definition in the definition section is hydraulic acreage. Yes. Is that is that better a better fit here than hydraulic acreage? Maybe it's, we know what it means, but just to um, it certainly sounds reasonable to me. I there's no distinction. Any okay. of our engineers have any input on that one? That would be fine. <laughs> Just trying to spice it up a little bit. So which <laughs> thank, thank you for that. Okay. Which which, uh, which do you want us to so Mary can put it in there that we'll have the right agreed on term? Acreage or area? What do you do you care? Um, it seems more consistent say to say acreage. And I think the intent of it would be the same. So if you know where we are to just amend that acreage, <coughs> okay, so we're good. Okay, so now we're moving on from G um, into section 280-7, scope of responsibility. Oh, pardon me, 280-8, purposes of the fund. Uh, we had said receipts from the stormwater and flood control utility shall be used for the following purposes, and then we enumerate these purposes. Councilor Adams suggests replacing that sentence with the stormwater and flood control utility fee shall only be used for the direct and indirect costs of the utility. And then I can't tell from the notes. Let me ask a question. So is the including our proposal? Okay. Yes. <coughs> so it's just replacing that sentence. Uh, Instead of saying receipts from the stormwater and flood control utility fee shall be used for the following purposes, Councilor Adams suggests the stormwater and flood control utility fee shall only be used for direct and indirect costs of the utility, including, and then the enumerated list. Now as that list goes on, um, when we, we'll circle back to this. This is where M, M falls would, into this would list. We would, would affect 288. Correct. All right. So we'll, we're not going to do M now, but that's where it goes when we get to this. Yes. <coughs> In section 280 9, uh, this is where we specifically proposed exempting land with permanent conservation or agricultural preservation restrictions. Councilor Adams proposes to strike that paragraph making those exemptions. Uh, we, we have no, no comment on that. It was an attempt to uh, address concerns of the planning department, but it, it doesn't have an impact on the technical collection or use of the fee. It's, a, it's again, a political decision, I think. In section 280-10, There's a little bit of uh, adjustment in the wording. Uh, stormwater management and flood control utility credit policy shall be developed. Um, and it, he ins it suggests install inserting a date of uh, by July 1st of 2014. He proposes adding a sentence allowing that the city council shall have authority to modify the credit policy at any time. And then finally, he makes an addition to a sentence at the bottom of the paragraph. The stormwater management and flood control utility credit policy shall be available for inspection by the public at the Department of Public Works. And then Jesse proposes adding and on the city website. Uh, again, we're completely comfortable with, with those additions. Okay, carry your question. I, yes. I would just like to, to note actually that I, I created confusion here because I sort of put in the same suggestion as Councillor Adams. So there is sort of duplicative language there. Oh, okay. Um, the first sentence that says the city council shall have the authority to modify the credit policy at any time. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that's... A is, is repeated in F. Mm -hmm. So if you want to take out that sentence in section A, that would seem to be... So, 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 section, so delete the city council shall have the authority to modify the credit policy. Delete that <coughs> sentence because it's covered in section F. Exactly. Okay. Around this page here. Uh, D. All right, so 
this, this one here, he's suggesting taking out this sentence because, yeah, because of this. So we're leaving in the, uh, the addition of that uh, the credit policy shall be available but for inspection at the DPW or on the website. Then moving down to the paragraph F that we've just been discussing, there's a new suggesting proposing a new, new paragraph, the stormwater management and flood control utility fee credit policy as developed, maintained, and from time to time amended by the Department of Public Works and approved by the Board of Public Works may also be amended at any time by the City Council. Or that seems perfectly reasonable. Uh, moving on, uh, section 280-12, appeals, hearings, no, no comments there. Section 280-13, public reports. Uh, Councilor O'Donnell has proposed adding this section and uh, a paragraph that will read, the Board of Public Works will make an annual presentation to the City Council providing information related to the work and projects financed by the stormwater and flood control utility during the previous year including, to the extent that it's practical, an account of expenditures from the stormwater management and flood control account and projected future expenditures. The board will also present this information at a written in a written report which shall be accessible on the city website. That, that sounds terrific. So with the exception of M, those are all proposals made by Councilors Adams and O'Donnell. And all of those have concurrence from the Board of Public Works. Now, well, we can't actually <coughs> speak to our fellow councilors. I know the second oldest <laughs> councilor is in the room and was around when the Youth Commission looked at that. You know, with nonverbal head gestures, was there anything, an amendment that came from the Youth Commission that went anywhere? You haven't caught We have. One we have all right. So we still have to deal with them. <coughs> Okay, so um, do you want to talk about some suggestions that are coming now from the Department of Public Works? Okay, so these are these have occurred as the process has been ongoing based on new information from the rating of these projects. That's correct. So you'll see uh, you'll see that this is a draft of February 12th. So it's, it's distinct from the one we were just looking at. Okay, um, we're proposing to insert the date of 2014 instead of 2013. Um, uh, going to pay section 280-4 definitions. We're going to suggest simplifying the def definition of a credit. Uh, we're striking the, the last few lines there. Credit, we're proposing that a credit should mean the reduction in the amount of a stormwater and flood control utility fee charged to a particular property, period. Uh, we're striking for the existence and use of privately owned, maintained, and operated on-site or off-site stormwater management systems or facilities or continuing provision of services or activities that reduce or might mitigate the city's cost of providing stormwater management services for that particular property. So proposing to strike the, the extra verbiage there. Can you give us a rationale for why you decided to do that? Well, we felt it actually expanded the reasons by trying to delineate exactly what reasons might uh, generate the, the need for a credit or the, the value of credit. We realized we might leave something out. It's broader to just say a credit is uh, a reduction in the bill. For a particular property, so it was, it was the intention was to broaden the, the definition. For example, senior credits is mentioned on the side there. That we, you know, as soon as you by by inadvertent omission, we could knock out a category of credits just because we forgot to mention it. 
Um, then the next, the next one is, let's see how I should tell you where this is. Well, we're still in 280-4 definitions, and if you run your eye down the line there, there's impervious surface, large residential property, and then we come to non-residential property. Uh, we're suggesting to strike the word improved. It currently says non-residential property means improved property. It is not residential property, and on and on. And we decided that saying improved didn't, doesn't necessarily have to be improved to be non-residential. Um, so again, in attempting to be accurate, we inadvertently had left out a, a category. We're trying to make the definition broader. A number of people had asked for a definition of pervious surface, uh, so we, we propose inserting that as, as the next paragraph. Pervious surface means those areas that allow the unimpeded infiltration of stormwater into the soil. Common pervious surfaces include, but are not limited to, lawn areas, forest land, agricultural land, meadows, and under, un, other undeveloped land. In determining utility fee calculations, all land on a parcel of property not defined as impervious shall be considered to be pervious. Hmm. Uh, frankly, that was to make sure we didn't leave anything out in the definition of pervious. <laughs> that last comment there. <coughs> uh, the, down the way there, we added the space, so just correcting a typo. Yeah, 280 uh, 6, paragraph D. Um, we have a small typo. We're just correcting a word there. We're replacing and with by. So uh, the Board of Public Works each year um, shall determine the hydraulic uh, area of account. Or, uh, I should just read the sentence. The billing rate per square foot of hydraulic area will be calculated by the Department of Public Works and approved by the Board of Public Works each year by dividing the approved annual budget as described above. And, we're, and then we said and in the original one, but it should be by dividing the budget by, and that's a, a change we're suggesting, the total hydraulic area to be built in the city of Northampton. It changes the meaning of that sentence. Yeah. Do you also want that to be acreage instead of area? I think that would be a good idea, just so it's consistent all the way through. <coughs> so now we get to the most substantial change that we're proposing. And then let me see if I can explain it clearly for you. It was the intention of the Board of Public Works and I think of the task force that we come up with some way of creating standardized bills for small residential properties. Uh, in the initial calculations, it looked like having a break point of 2,000 and 4,000 square feet of impervious surface came out with very neatly, a very neatly aligned bell curve of residential properties ranging from small to medium to large. We got almost exactly, it appeared, 25% of the properties classified as small, roughly 50% would be medium, and about 25% would be large. If we had break points at 2,000 square feet, and 4,000 square feet. It was very serendipitous, and of course it didn't last. Um, Camp Dresser and McKee is currently undergoing a um, project to clean up the data we have for impervious surfaces, the aerial mapping data. They're going to open up the file for all 9,200 approximately properties in the city and look at it file by file. Cross-checking the impervious surface, we have uh, two or three methods of determining impervious surface using aerial mapping data. They're going to cross-check. They're going to correct for errors such as occasionally a driveway appears to cross a property line. Well, it's a mistake and that they'll adjust these property by property as they go along. We're beginning to get feedback from CDM. Uh, they've done about a quarter of the city at that point, at this point, with a mix of residential and commercial properties. And we can see that the group of residential properties that are, happen to fall below 2,000 square feet of impervious 
surface is smaller than we had thought. So all of a sudden, the small residential tier gets smaller, more people get pushed into medium and large, and it kind of it slightly skews the, the entire results of the fund by, by moving the amount of fee generated around. Um, in time, we may be able to say, and let me just add one more po point, the city is planning to uh, participate in a regional <laughs> low-level aerial mapping program over the next couple of years, and I'm quite sure that once we get that data, which will be even more accurate, we might have to revisit these square footages again. So let's say hypothetically the correct breakpoint for these small, medium, large categories might be between small and medium, might be 2,384 square feet. Well, rather than trying to pick a number and enshrine it in the ordinance, we're proposing that instead we just say the residential properties will be divided up such that 25% of the properties shall be small, 50% medium, 25% large. And then as new and better and more accurate data comes in in the years to come, those breakpoints can be adjusted as needed to maintain that nice uh, distribution that we like to begin with. So we're proposing in section 280-6, section E, that we strike the A, B, and C sections that talk about properties with 2,000 square feet, more than 2,000, more than 4,000. We suggest striking that and instead saying, small residential properties shall be divided into three groups based on the amount of impervious area. These groups shall be sized such that 25% of these properties fall into the smallest category, 50% shall be in the middle category, 25% shall be in the largest category. All properties, go ahead. Just in that same vein, um, will that, those amounts that you mentioned earlier be the same? I mean, you're, you're Very close. And that, I'll, 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 talk to, I'll address that in a okay. second, if I can. <clears throat> so, and then a couple of tweaks in, in the end. All properties within each group shall receive the same bill. The bill for each group shall be calculated by using the average amount of impervious and impervious area for all of the properties that fall within that group. So we calculate the bill for the hypothetical average property within the group and then, and then send the bills. Um, okay, Councilor Kahn. The, as it happens, the way we did do it using 2,000 and 4,000 happened to break into a nice 25, 50, 25 breakdown. By instead dividing it up as 25, 50, 25, we come up with almost identical bills within two or three percent. It, it just slightly changes things. Um, we can also see, as we're beginning to get information back from CDM, that we have been underestimating the amount of impervious surface on residential properties. In other words, they tend to have a little more than we thought they did, which, is, which leads to this problem in part. And the commercial properties so far, and they haven't finished, we're only 25% of the way through this, commercial properties are coming in a little lower than we had thought. If you, if you actually look at the computer data for properties, the impervious surface isn't crisp, neat lines yet. It's going to be when CDM gets done. But the initial information we had, be better to think of a blob. So instead of a nice rectangular ranch house, it was kind of like a, an oval blobby thing. That's what we were looking at for measuring the amount of impervious surface on a property. When we get done, it's going to look more, much more like a house than a driveway. Um, these blobs gave us slightly imprecise measurements. As I say, CDM, as the information comes in, it's clear that residential is going to creep up a little bit, commercial is going to come down a little bit. We have uh, done sensitivity analysis, like what if it's 5% off, what if it's 10% off. Even those numbers don't move by much. Um, for the small category, instead of $61, it might be as low as 59 or as high as 64, 65. So just, just little tweaks. Uh, we have created some new tables, and I think we'll be releasing those in the next few days, showing what would happen if the trends that we see so far continue. Too much information. 
Okay. So that, that's the big one. In Section E, we're suggesting breaking it down by percentage rather than by square footage, with the intention of being the intention being that we wind up in exactly the same place. Sure. Um, I, have a, I have a question for you. In fact, yes. I may have asked it to you in, in, in the past. I can't remember, but I think this is a good forum to, to restate it, even if I did. Um, did you consider at any point more brackets, if you want to call them that? You essentially have three. You have the lowest, the highest, and a, a large middle. And if you're trying to simulate some kind of progressivity in the fee, did you consider at, at least four? Or are there kind of were there effects of that that were not desirable? No, no, I, I don't think we went past three. There's no reason we couldn't. But they just become progressively more accurate. The initial intent was to avoid having to measure every single one of those 6,600 properties. Right. Breaking them into four groups isn't much more work than three. Uh, if the council decides that that sounds like a good idea, I don't think it would be a lot of work. It's just a m fairly minor change in the approach. I, I, would, I, I don't, and I don't think it would have any large unintended consequences. I was just kind of shooting from the hip, I guess, on this. So sure. I don't want to throw a wrench in at the last minute. I, I, we'd have to look at things like how the bills would change. To be honest, choosing three was not um, a highly. Yeah, you know, we didn't put a lot of effort into saying three. It sounded like <coughs> a good idea, uh, and I think it didn't uh, get much more thought than that. Oh, maybe to the council's point. So for that one large middle of 50%, if a, if a property were actually on the lower end of that middle and closer to the $61, um, but ends up paying the $94, mm -hmm. um, it's paying the same amount as the person who's on the far end, closer to the 243 Yeah. And so it raises the, you know, a possible equity issue. If, if it were something mm -hmm. like a break right in the middle until we have um, yeah, if, if we broken into quartiles, I think they're called, the uh, quarters, I think that would just need to be directed uh, accordingly, and I'm sure we could make that happen. <coughs> and I, I don't, my initial thought is that it would not skew the number as much, but it would certainly be fairer. You'd probably have, a, you'd, have a, you'd have four figures then, too. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it might be 60, 80, 110, you know, or something. Mm -hmm. We'd have to calculate it. Uh, if you wanted, would you be willing? I mean, if there's something you're strong enough about to ask them to see if they can do that, do that, and have a recommendation for us when this appears at council? Or I mean, I'd, be, I'd be curious if you could attach some some numbers to it. I, I hate to just throw it out there; it's fairly significant change, and then do it now. But if it, it's, it seems like we could do it in the full council, if there were favorable, you know, research from you that said this is a good idea. So yes, yeah, so if, if that's okay, I, I would be interested in, in seeing I, those. We could do that. Okay. Uh, uh, moving on in section 280-A, purposes of the fund. Originally, it said receipts from the stormwater and flood control utility fee shall be used for the following purposes. Uh, we propose changing that, adding some words in the, mo in the middle. Receipts from the stormwater and flood control utility fees shall be used for stormwater management and flood control services as defined in section 280-4. And also includes the following purposes. Um, trying to make a connection back to the definitions and, and, and add a little clarity. Right. Our intent there is not to change the, the substance of the Moving on, going to section 280-10. Oh, yes. Uh, Jim has some additional comments. Yes. I was going to whisper yes. in your ear. Yeah, there you go. I'll do that later. Um, I just <laughs> wanted to, uh, to acknowledge to the, to, the, uh, to the counselors that the section that uh, Terry just went through, 280-8, and the amendment linking section 280-4 to 280-8 for purposes of the fund, Councilor Adams had also recommended a change to that sentence, so those two sentences would need to be reconciled. We didn't have any issue with what Councilor Adams had proposed, so those two sentences need to be married in some fashion. So, hence the change. Hence, 
the marriage of those two sentences would need to be done, and it hasn't been. It has, yes. it has yes. not been. Yes. But we didn't have any problem with what Councillor Adams had proposed, but we had developed the linkage separate, separately mm -hmm. than what he had done. They're developed in parallel tracks. Yes. yes. Yes, we are. Okay, that's okay. We've got to keep Mary on track of where we are, though. So. I'm, I'm completely confused. You have this version with all of the counselors' amendments, and now you've got a new version, and you said you're going to marry them? I, I don't understand yeah. what you mean. Yeah, yeah. the other version of the part of our staff comments, so I think, think with um, Terry Jim uh, just suggested it. Right, but some of the comments that you've got in here from the counselors are not in this version at all. No, none of them. Mm -hmm. And you're wanting me to put them all together, or you're going to? No, do there's right? one specific thing we're talking about now. I just want to make sure Terry shows you what he's talking about. I understand we were that. Seriously? Do you want to change it? No, it's not just one sentence. No, there are all these other changes by the counselors, plus the ones that they're adding. I think they only, at this point, they have two redundant sentences, and they want to just make the language consistent. A actually, um, not to go back and forth, but I'll point out to Terry. So what we, we received from Mary and from Jim were the version that has all of the staff comments and changes, mm -hmm. and then the version that has the counselor amendments. That's correct. And There's so and so to actually take those two versions and put them together would require some time. That, that I understand what, what Mary's saying. So mm -hmm. we, I think we among ourselves have to figure out um, how that, who's going to do that work. We've, we've become uh, intimately familiar with um, all of these. And these documents it's, it's possible your word processor, correct? It, Not it's Mary. possible that uh, it might be convenient, if, if everyone's agreeable, for us <coughs> to marry it all together. Mm -hmm. Since you've got it all right. there. Yes. They're both in track yeah. changes? Yes. In the, in the yeah. Word yeah. We have here. And our version that stated the 11th that, those Counselor are all counselors one, amendments. And the one from the 12th includes the more recent yeah. DPW. Yeah. So yes. that's how I'm that's how I'm And they're both it. changes to the same do underlying under the document. Same document yeah. So but I think we would take those recommended changes from staff and incorporate them into the ones mm -hmm. that are accepted yeah. by the mm -hmm. counselors and, mm -hmm. and would also delete yeah. those couple of sentences, the one just yeah. referenced. And when okay. we deal with this tonight, I'm proposing we deal with it as, you know, the counselor amendments, right. the staff, staff amendments. Right. And then we'll move on to M, which will be its own thing. Okay. Yeah. So you'll marry those. But let's make sure Mary, under, or are you going to reconcile those two sentences when you do the wordsmithing? Yes. 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 Okay. So Mary doesn't have to worry about that. Okay. Okay. Okay, if we go to section 280-10, stormwater and flood control utility fee credits. We have a couple of uh, minor um, changes. In section D, discussing uh, where to obtain the credit, uh, property owner will make an application to the city on forms provided by the Department of Public Works for such purpose. The, and we're proposing to say the application to be fully completed in accordance as opposed to the form to be fully completed. We're changing form to application. It's, it's wordsmithing. A little further down in section 280-11, section B, um, stormwater and flood control utility bills shall be managed by the Department of Public Works for collection. And we're proposing to say the Northampton tax collector, as opposed to the director of public works, shall keep records of all paid and unpaid stormwater utility bills and maintain financial records for the utility. And again, the law <coughs> for that is that it's being billed through that office and they're going to be... Yeah, the collector's records. office does maintain those. Uh, and then also in Section 280-11, stormwater and flood control utility fee billing. Under Section D, at any time after interest begins to accrue in an unpaid account, the, we're saying, instead of saying the collector, we prefer to say the Northampton tax collector may serve on the party assessed a statement of the amount due. 
So we're basically going through in that paragraph and replacing collector with Northampton tax collector. And that's the extent of the staff suggestions. For the most part, except for the, the breakdown on the res small residential fee, it's just tweaks on word. So there's one other. So we've done the original version. We've done the Councilor Adams and O'Donnell amendments that DPW has accepted yeah. as friendly. Yeah. And then we've done the most recent, with the exception of Scribner errors, basically the three 2550s, 25 distribution rather than a hard square foot. So yes. There's, there's two others that I wanted to just follow up to see where they went. And one of them um, was, and you, and you may have covered this, but they're, they're separate, so I want to make sure they get in there. Uh, Councilor Adams and Mr. Biden talked about adding a 286F. And I don't know if you've talked about that one yet. Property owners own multiple undeveloped parcels with yes. protected status. Did, where where does, does that one live in one of the previous versions, or is this a separate amendment we need to do? It? At the, at the, up until this day, yeah. that had lived in the credit policy. Yeah. Um, Councilor Adams, I believe, feels that this is an important enough point to move it into the ordinance itself. Mm -hmm. uh, we proposed it in the beginning. We're just moving it, I believe, intact so that it's expressly stated in the ordinance as opposed to being over in the credit mm -hmm. policy. The concept is that down in the meadows, there are a number of property owners down there who have multiple pieces of land any one of which would qualify for the one acre maximum. And the idea is rather than giving him, because they own six parcels, giving them six bills, we acknowledge the uh, impact of that and just say, no, one acre is the maximum. For all the parcels. For one owner, open land, multiple parcels. Mm -hmm. And this is even if they're not contiguous? Correct. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the, the real the issue. The real is. trick here is that they're not contiguous, yeah. but they, they're treated as one piece. That's correct. Okay. And is that already incorporated in either the 11th or the 12th version, or do we need to, to add this? That will need to be added to more recent uh, amendments. Okay. So I, just, I don't want to lose track of any of these. This came on the email. Yeah. Right. Okay. Did you also give this a paper copy, or should I look at my yeah, there's okay. a paper copy and the pile of copies. Um, so when we're when we're making our motions later, we have to add that one to the list, and then you can incorporate it when you blend the 11th and the 12th versions, so that we get it. Okay. Yes. So do the wordsmithing, but we got to incorporate that. Right. So I'm just gonna. So the only thing that's left. Oh, one other thing. The youth commission. I just wanted to bring those up so that we don't forget them. And they didn't. I don't have them as motions, but I have them in a letter from the Youth Commission. One was, and, and you can just let us know if, if you've reviewed these and what your recommendation was, mm -hmm. um, an exemption from the fee for all Northampton public school properties. And I'm assuming mm -hmm. the, the city is being billed for its properties and that includes... Yes, I mean, it's, it's been extensively discussed and debated. Okay. And I, I think broad consensus that we should leave that as it is. And then their second suggestion was an abatement for those in the process of attempting to increase their pervious land area or somehow conform to EPA standards. We hope that's covered in the credit manual. Uh, we hope that if they were to review the credit manual, they would agree. But so you, you did address that. Yes. take those into yes. consideration, <laughs> but did not recommend them. Right. Yeah, uh, It was a pleasure dealing with them. They're uh, great kids. They were very interested in the whole process and uh, spent a lot of time working on this. So I, I just wanted to make sure that their letter got mentioned in this yeah. meeting and that you have seen it in the draft. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that brings us to everything but M. Right. Is there anybody in the audience that wants to comment on where we are to this point? We'll take some comment now, and, and if everyone buys all of how we got <coughs> here so far, then we'll go to M, which is where I think the, where the contention lies with the last section M. Anybody want to comment on where we are to this point, or should we have Terry move on to M? 
if I might. Oh, just come on up and identify yourself so we know who you sure. are for the record, and then please make your comment. Joseph Sharp. And I reside in uh, Ward 4. I noticed that this provision to dedicate fees uh, to use solely of this project versus allowing it to slip into the general fund. Uh, apparently, as it stands now, do I understand correctly that they would permit those funds to go into the general fund? Any surplus? The, at this point, they would live within the dedicated fund. Sold. Yeah. Now and they would be mean. M, M and be carried forward. M kind of addresses what expenses could be in there. Okay. But at this point, and to correct me if I'm wrong, the, the it's a it's an enterprise fund for stormwater, and the funds stay in there. If they're not fully extended, Good. they remain for that purpose alone. And the enterprise fund is a closed container. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, considering the EPA will be tightening the noose further in the future, I think that's a wise decision because there's going to need more funds when that happens. And if we have a little kitty set aside of previous surplus, inshallah, then it will end up <coughs> having something in bank, unlike what we have now since 1938, no fees being collected or charges being made. All right, uh, the rate for permeability of land, I wonder if that factor that they refer to also considers the factors of slope or gradient, if you prefer, and that's something the engineering group <coughs> does, and likewise the soil characteristics which are available on USGS soil maps for this entire area, I'm sure. People that are on sandy soil will have a very much different rate of permeability than people who are on clay. Simple, obvious, but might be too picky even. Perhaps I don't know. And it's, it's my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, that soil conditions and grade have not been considered just total area for this computation. Just total area. Is well, I'm, I want to ask the engineers. Sure. I think I that's the case. Yes. But yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. So soil composition and grade mean nothing. If you live on the side of a 45 degree hill, and the water tears down, and you've got huge gullies, well, that's your problem. But meanwhile you get the same permeability rate as the guy that's on a flat piece of land that's being flooded twice a year. That's interesting. All right. Let us all consider also this factor of roofs being impervious. If the area of the structure is equal to the area of the land, I can see where there is a factor that the runoff will be considered impervious in the sense of you have to deal with it. But if it comes off a roof onto residential permeable land or other permeable lands, presumably that's going to simply add to the permeability and not be considered as runoff per se. And cor again, correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, Jim was taking this in back there. That maybe. No, he, he was taking it in, but okay. it's my understanding from the current writing of the ordinance that even if your property manages to absorb all, you know, if your impervious area absorbs all the water that comes from the impervious area, mm -hmm. it is not taken into consideration. You'll be billed based on pervious and impervious. And it even will be if not a drop of water leaves your property. So it will be impervious nonetheless. Bill at the higher rate. Uh, even if you put, a, say, a big deep sink of filled with gravel that went down and absorb all 30 the water. feet. Yeah. yeah. You'll still be billed the same way as everybody is my understanding. Is that correct? Yeah. There's no consideration as to does it for your property or not shed any water. Mm -hmm. It pervious, impervious, how much do you have that? So it's a maximum simplification of the scenario. Uh, and Terry, do you have a? Right. Uh, All right. right. Stormwater mitigation features might qualify you for credits. For credit. Gotcha. Thank you. <coughs> All right. Well, Lastly. Just, just another question for Terry related to that. So if you live in a modern subdivision for which a stormwater system was developed and essentially your street games drains go into a pond that you're required to maintain on your property to handle that, you would potentially be eligible for credit to the people in that subdivision for the fact that they've made steps towards mitigating, right? Uh, I'll, I'll let Jim answer that, but it, that, that particular issue has been a sticky one. Um, 
the building inspector would have you build the building to certain standards, uh, and you wouldn't get a credit on your taxes because you put a receptacle every eight feet per the electrical code. We, we want people to build uh, sound structures, sound infrastructures for subdivisions, and it doesn't immediately follow that because you followed the code, you should get a credit. So there's been quite a bit of discussion about whether the fact that you followed the code automatically would qualify you. Has anyone implied bill. that the code requires you have a separate uh, receptacle for code, water? But the, the, the permits for subdivisions do stipulate stormwater management practices. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, you're following the infrastructure. Code. And if you exceed those standards? That sounds like a creditable. Um, certainly does. Thank you. Okay. All right. Then the last thing is your issue of attempting to improve property permittability as a factor for uh, mitigation in terms of application of fees. Uh, is this open-ended, or is there a timetable for such attempted improvements? Can somebody say, oh, well, I'm attempting to improve the situation uh, five years later. Well, I'm still working on it. I think we need to put a cap on that. I'll hand to the PCW. Sure. Well, it's not a question that requires a direct response. What it requires is something so aggressive. And uh, That's if you right. gentlemen from DPW want to comment on that one, you're welcome to. All I might say is that we see the credit policy as a living document. Mm -hmm. Someone's going to come to us with a, a novel approach that we haven't mm -hmm. thought about that isn't mm -hmm. specifically mentioned in the credit policy that could easily uh, encourage us to th rethink that area, maybe come up with an added definition. So I can see over the next 5, 10, 20 years, this document will grow and, and, and evolve, hopefully for the better. I think you're missing the suggestion here that you put a cap on the amount of period uh, someone can enjoy any uh, evasion, uh, oh, well, we have. postpone, I, I, et cetera. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. We have done that. Roger. Thank you. That's all. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Any other comments at this point? Or should we move on to M? <coughs> Hearing none. Okay, Terry, you want to come up and present M and let us know <coughs> what the discussion was at TPW last night and what why your re recommendation is the way it is, and then we'll take public comment on that. Okay. Uh, first of all, everyone at the department and on the Board of Public Works is broadly supportive of, of ensuring that the money we raised by this fee is used for the intended purpose. So I, I think all of the people working on this issue are, broadly speaking, on the same page. Um, the discussion last night um, ranged over three areas of concern. Uh, there are those on the board who weren't even sure we should be passing judgment on this because it seems like a municipal policy decision, exactly how, how the uh, income within the fund can be distributed. Uh, our concern is more to the technical side of things, to make sure, for example, that we weren't enjoined from borrowing money. That would, that would be a big red flag. But how the indirects are calculated isn't a primary concern of the Board of Public Works. Several members were concerned about treating this enterprise fund differently from the other three, solid waste, water, and sewer. And it got the whole room talking about the pros and cons. Uh, if this one's different than those, do we have, should we go back and look at those? It, it was just unresolved. I, I'm not trying to imply that the Board of Public Works had strong feelings. Frankly, they had more questions than opinions. Finally, there were those in the room who argued that surely some of the administrative expenses are reasonable. Uh, it's hard to tell from the language where the boundaries are between a reasonable and an unreasonable expense. Um, in the end, they felt their only options were either to support the amendment as written or to say they couldn't support it as written. The fact that they didn't support it as written should not be construed as a broad feeling that um, there was anything wrong with the intent of it. So that's All the right, gist so of the discussion. So I'm, since no one's actually read it, I'll, I'll read it so that people, by the
either watching the video or in the room that haven't read it, but most of you probably have will know what it is. And um, this would be M, and it's added to 280 what, 8? 280-8. So it would gain M. And M would say, in no case shall the general fund budget receive budget relief from the revenue derived from the stormwater fee. For avoidance of doubt, such items as one, payment in lieu of taxes or pilots, and to explain for those who don't know what pilots are, this would pre prevent, and this has never been proposed, correct, Eric? Correct. Pilots. But a pilot would be, for instance, that the, the fund would pay in lieu of private property taxes for the stormwater system. And that truly would be a mechanism where it would be collecting money through this fee to support the general, would be essentially like a, a private property tax that would go to the general fund. So that's what it would do, and that is that has never been proposed. This would spell out the fact that it was never going to happen. And two, general fund administrative costs that cannot be directly or exclusively assigned to one service, right? allocations or operating transfers, and shall not be paid from this enterprise fund. The single exception will be for the cost of employee benefits associated with direct salary costs of DPW personnel paid from the stormwater budget as such benefits are currently budgeted in the general fund. Right. And by general government, I would understand this to mean um, the tax collector is going to bill and collect this. The feeling is that the tax collector is a general, general government responsibility. The tax collector is already billing you know, water and sewer and, if, and CPA and, and property taxes, and one more line item should not be making more work for them, and therefore, they're already doing it. They shouldn't. I believe that's they the shouldn't intent, be yes. getting funds from <coughs> this fee to do what they're already doing. That kind of thing. Or perhaps if the assessor is involved, generating a report or something, they shouldn't be billing their time for this. Rate. That's the intent. All right. That's the understanding of this one. All right. Um, any more comments you want to make from DPW before we open this one up to public comment? Uh, no. I, uh, I think. So broadly speaking, we got stuck on the language, and in the end, yeah. And it was last night. It was just last night. Okay. So, so this is, in DPW's opinion, we'll get the public comment. But this thing is still open for further discussion with the board. Absolutely. From this point on. Yes. All right. Okay. Good. Then let's take public comment on this one. Um, and perhaps, oh, Mr. Effort, please. I, I'll lead off. I signed the sheet first. Edward Etheridge of North Hampton, 64 Gothic Street. Uh, for the past uh, year, I have worked with the uh, Economic Development Subcommittee of the Chamber uh, with the DPW and other constituents in the city uh, for public hearings and crafting this ordinance and uh, the language, the calculation, um, the methodology for developing the fee. Um, and we begin with looking at the cases in Massachusetts on what constitutes a fee and what constitutes a tax because we wanted to make sure that when it was crafted, it was crafted as a fee that would be successful and not be objected to, even though many of the purposes of this particular fee are general sort of obligations such as flood control, which apply to the community <coughs> as a whole. The committee's work and the chamber set uh, its, itself its own goal, which the committee uh, did adopt, was to make sure that the fee was equitable, uh, both in its application uh, and its assessment, and that the process and language of the ordinance be transparent. Um, the committee had made a couple of compromises in that process. The chief amongst uh, was the compromise in the, which we discussed uh, earlier, which accepts all of the city's uh, ways and streets, uh, which is actor and creator of stormwater and flood issues in the city. But the idea would be that that would be an extra inordinate expense that would then go back to the tax base that would be charged against it. And so the idea that it was equitable is compromised to some extent, um, but the committee, the DPW, and others on there did hold fast on a lot of other exceptions that were requested. Um, the schools, I guess, is still up in the air, but n does not receive support. Open land uh, has been accommodated with uh, factors uh, modifying the cost so the burden of it has been reduced, but the principle has been somewhat compromised. The biggest principle that the Economic Development Committee uh, would
which supports adding Section M to the is exactly as Councillor Adams expressed. We have talked to members and to the community in proposing this fee, which will be uh, a fee, burdensome, a cost, uh, which will affect not only homeowners, uh, but will affect many of our nonprofits, uh, from the largest, uh, such as uh, Smith College and the hospital, uh, to the smallest, um, small nonprofits, (coughs) churches, um, all will be subject to this. That makes it equitable. Um, but what we don't want to do is convert it from a fee <coughs> into a tax increase or a tax. And the issue with M is it makes it clear that none of the funds from this can be used for general city service obligations, which it already provides. The trade off is. As you mentioned, it may be that the collector spends a marginal amount of time now adding this to the bill, so we can say we'll add a cost of the collector's office, 10% of the salary, 8.6% of one collector's salary, 3.4% of the assessment. But it's providing general fund relief, and it's not providing stormwater funds. If there is a cost for those things that is necessary, it seems to me we can find a home within the budget of the stormwater utility to accommodate that. We had much discussion about the purposes of the funds, which are quite broad, and we don't have a problem with those funds. They accommodate all of the things that the Department of Public Works and Board of Public Works is concerned about. The fact that they will have bonding ability with a revenue stream, the fact that physical facilities and improvements will be covered. I'm sure they're already calculating the new BPW headquarters as part of this particular thing, that's in there. That can be accommodated by this particular thing. But the compromise that should not be struck with the voters, not be struck with the citizens of the community, is to say we will provide general relief with the stormwater utility. Why is this different than the other enterprise funds? Because we did that with the other enterprise funds, and there are people who are not happy about that prospect, whether it's small or not. I understand the intent of the people who propose that it be treated exactly like it is in 53 and a half of chapter 44, which doesn't spell out how it's done. It just says it can be done. The amendment that we're proposing is, as Councillor Adams suggested, in the Department of Revenue manual for local services, which says, spell it out. It's up to the municipality to make that decision. If you don't adopt him, you clearly are making the decision that we will leave it to powers that be to make a decision at certain points in time to provide these funds for general fund relief, which is a tax. That's okay if that's what you want to do, but if you don't adopt M, that's what you are inviting. M makes it clear that the purpose of this fund was to provide for stormwater and flood control um, services that the city has not funded. The city is already getting quite a bit of general fund relief from this particular enterprise because they have not funded flood control and stormwater projects over the past because they've only been able to fund those out of the tax base and there are too much competition for the tax revenues of the city that those get shifted to the back burner and don't get funded. So there is a huge number that the city will be receiving in general (coughs) fund relief from having a stormwater flood control utility fee that replaces funds that the city has spent and should be spending for those particular purposes. So we encourage you to consider, adopt, and approve Section M as Councillor Adams has proposed to it in his memo. Thank you. Now going back to our list, uh, Jesse Adams is number two on the request for comment. And so you already spoken your piece, so you're good. Um, and then help with this, Mary. This looks like Mary Ann. Suzanne Beck. Oh, well, that's Suzanne Beck, and she's already. Oh, defo- you're back. I saw you get up. Uh, would you like to come up and? Uh, I think my. I was really going to comment on the general ordinance, so I think I'll save that for a city council meeting and just. Okay, because you're I'm welcome not, to speak. No, you know, I don't have any like particular. Um, oh, no, uh, Jack. Uh, 
that Ritter, Bader? Or it was for you, but I crossed it off. I'm going to express it, Jack. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't good. write too well anyway, but, but I'm going to have it remain crossed off because I think every single point has covered. that has been adequately covered in quite nicely. <coughs> okay, thank you. Uh, and Mr. Jasky, or do, you, do you want to speak more at this point, or you, have you I said would, your piece? I would support Ed Etheridge 100% plus what I already said. Plus what you have, in addition to what you already said. Okay. And uh, uh, Bob Reckman, do you have uh, something I you want to add at this point? Uh, my name is Bob Reckman. I served for 15 years on the Board of Public Works, seven of them as chair. I fully appreciate how neglected our stormwater and flood control system is and welcome this effort to raise money to pay for these vital services. I'm chairman of the Economic Development Committee of the Chamber of Commerce and was on the Chamber's Stormwater and Flood Control Task Force as well, and I served on the Stormwater and Flood Control Task Force. The process has been really a, a perfect example. It's, although it's been a little bit long, everybody's worked together diligently to craft a very good ordinance. It's been explained to the public and the business community extensively, and nobody wants to pay more money for things they've been getting, should have been getting all along. But I believe that the new system is very fair overall. It's great the city's going to participate. We welcome the tax exempt dollars to help us out. Uh, and it's my belief that the community at large supports it because it's been done so fairly. There are a couple of amendments I want to talk about the council items proposed. Uh, the first one is the, the, the supermajority requirement. And I believe that for, for many citizens, it will give them an extra measure of comfort to have the bar raised that little bit higher if you go over $2 million in the long, long run. So that's a, a, a good amendment, I think. The second thing is the general fund relief. Uh, the first important fact, which Councillor Etheridge just alluded to, is that if this ordinance passes, the city will receive effective general fund relief. The city now spends round numbers, $350,000 a year on stormwater and flood control. Let's pay about half that much. So I think that I understand that the, the new utilities can require assistance from the city solicitor, from the treasurer's office, from the assessor, et cetera, et cetera. But I argue that those will be small potatoes compared to the $175,000 the city is going to save every year. And one approach is to say, geez, what a great thing. Let's don't charge this, this utility for those services. So that would be one option. I know there are other people who disagree. And as you know, the city's comp accounting system is get direct and indirect costs. It's a real thick in there about the, how to define things satisfactory to everybody. Um, I think Jesse's intent is perfect. I hope that the council can craft even better language, which would allow the kind of expenses, kind of expenses we all know this is intended for, uh, but not bind it unnecessarily. If that can't be done, another thing you could do in the ordinance is you could say, okay, we're putting a cap of 2% on the fee that the, any fees that the, this utility would pay to the city's general fund. So that way there'd be a real cap in the ordinance. So, um, so there are three options that you've got to, that you can choose among. Um, our mayor, our city council, and our whole city government, I know, are com committed to financial transparency. And it's really been a great process for us to go through as a community. So thank you very much. And I hope it moves forward positively. OK. And I think, Fred, you're on the list. You uh, I, all, my, all my issues have been covered, so I'll pass on. You're all set. Yeah, I'm all set. All right. so, any more comment on any of this before we as a committee begin deliberating it? And again, if we have any questions or need expert opinions, we'll, we'll uh, certainly ask. So do we, I think we're the only one, and is the only one, that, that I think we need to deal with individually, because I think there's complete consensus on the rest of them. So shall we move the rest of them and then deal with them? That, okay, so that would be um, the version as amended on the 11th, and then the one from the 12th, and then we would add in F that came from last evening with regards to 
And I think that with the other two are the ones we have consensus on. If you're comfortable with that, if someone makes it. I would do those as a group, because those are the ones that all have consensus. So it would be the 11th version with Councilor Adams' modifications, the 12th version with the DPW technical modifications, and then F, 286F, with regards to combining the open space parcels and issuing one bill. I think the first version um, on the 11th also includes Council Adams' amendments, am I correct? That's correct. And they both contain various small changes that made today. Right. That's right. right. So and as long as we're with those changes as noted by Mary mm -hmm. and Jim, we're yep. going to put those. And, and they're all in DPW's word processes. So, so after we do this, they'll make one composite version that brings us up to date with the exception of hands. I'll uh, move those then as we yep. Second. Any more discussion on those? Right. All in favor? Of a positive uh, recommendation? Positive, okay. positive recommendation. Aye. Okay. Now discussion on M. Well, uh, to put it on the floor, um, actually I'll move that to the full council with no recommendation. And do you want to? And then I'll just say why if I get a second. Okay. Second. Okay. So the motion is to move M to the full council without recommendation. Do you want to come? Yes. Yeah. Well, the reason I want to put put that to the full council without a recommendation from this body is that I think it requires more deliberation. Um, I, I had some questions about it, um, I, although I understood the, the uh, rationale from Attorney Etheridge. I had some specific questions too for Councilor Adams and I'm unable to do that here at this meeting. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's probably more appropriate to do um, at the full council. Okay. Comment on that? Um, can I just comment generally? Or oh, yeah. Um, um, I mean, well, I on the motion on it, I mean, relative to M, because that's what's relevant. Yeah, relative yeah. to yeah. M. I, I won't tell you what I did you know, this weekend. But okay. So. Um, <laughs> my, my, my comment on M is um, it, it seems, you know, when I read the set of regulations from the Department of Revenue, it really does seem like it, it leads to the uh, 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts to come up with their own rules. Um, there are some vague guidelines in, in, in the regulations, and I think it says somewhere that if we come up with a methodology that is unacceptable to the director of, of the Bureau, um, I forgot exactly what department it is, uh, in the Division of Local Services, they can reject it. That's my understanding. But until that happens, I mean, it's, we need to develop a policy, and I see nothing wrong with putting it in the ordinance. If we reach consensus about what that policy is. Mm -hmm. right. And my comment it would kind of be that it clearly is justified under DOR's advice relative to these enterprise funds, and particularly this type. So it certainly is justified, in my opinion, that we can go here. This isn't something that we can't do, it's something we're encouraged to do. And I accept, you know, the the statements made uh, by the me members of the Chamber Economic Development Committee that we've been so transparent to this point and we've had consensus on everything else to this point that we should include this one too. And also what Mr. Colhane said about the fact was, shucks this came up last night and the dialogue is still <coughs> open with his house on this one, it's just there wasn't time because it came up to us last night. So what my feeling is I'm comfortable with sending this without a recommendation. My hope would be between now and when this hits council that Council Adams, the maker of the motion, and DPW will continue to work and perhaps reach consensus so that when M returns to the council meeting, it will be like the rest of this. You know, it will have been processed to death and we'll have consensus and we can move forward with everybody in their happy place. And, and that would be my hope. Understanding that if that doesn't happen, Councilor Adams is going to bring it back just the way it is and put it on the floor of the council. So we're going to deal with it one way or the other. Either with a meeting of the minds with DPW or without, but it's coming, it's coming back one way or the other. And, and I also accept the fact that all of the counselors need to weigh in on this one. I mean, there is something correct in the fact that this is a political decision and we're the ones that make those so our constituents can tell us whether we did a good job or we didn't two years from now. So I think we all need to participate in this discussion of this or whichever version of it comes. So 
Yes, it's justified. And I'll make one more comment. Yes. Well, only that um, in hearing about it tonight and hearing uh, the rationale and the, the comments made earlier by, by Councilor Adams, um, one, one thought I have is that it isn't really distinct from other enterprise funds and that it begs the question really as to whether those other enterprise funds ought not to have some similar restriction or just I would hope that we would have some consistency along that level. We know that when we had a very flush um, solid waste enterprise fund, when we had the landfill going, we actually did rely on um, a good chunk of those funds for some very basic city services. And so we have to then consider whether, whether we want to limit ourselves in that way with all of our funds or whether we want to, I, I think the funds should, there should be some consistency along those lines. And so um, that's, that's my thought just initially, but I'm um, hoping to have a more full, robust mm -hmm. conversation with the whole mm -hmm. conference. Mr. Lohr, you hit your hand up. Do you want to make a comment? Or? No. No? Okay. We wore him out, I think. <laughs> um, any other discussion amongst us? Then um, to, 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 the, to, the, to the motion of sending this with no recommendation, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so that's unanimous. Um, and again, I, I think it, if DPW and Councilor Adams will keep working on this one, um, if, you, if you all can keep working on this one and come up with a consensus, it really would be nice to have the entire ordinance be of consensus. I, it would be nice to do that. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. And it's in the political venue of council where everybody gets to speak their piece and, uh, and weigh in on it. But I, I want to thank everybody involved to this point because to get something of this size to this point to council with only one bone of contention is really an, ama is an amazing thing. So to all the players in this on both sides, to DPW, to the chamber, to Councillor Adams and, and Councillor O'Donnell who amended this, to everybody who participated in all the meetings and all the wards, I, I think it's a, a job well done to get this far with only one thing and hopefully uh, by the next council meeting when this appears, even that could be taken care of because I know Terry said, gee, we're happy to keep talking about it, so hopefully we can do that. Um, they weren't formal amendments, if you want to. No, no they, they didn't pass them out through a DPW. They didn't bring them along. Nobody else brought them along, so I guess we're... And we have the one other that, uh, and that, no, that was included yeah, okay. in the, in, that one was included in, in the, in in the, the, in the full okay. bunch because we brought that up as well. Um, so with all my stuff up here, my agenda has been buried, but I think that was all that we had to do tonight. So with that, a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Thank you, everyone.